For many centuries, London was a dangerous place. It was a magnet for the very worst kind of people. Jack the Ripper dominated the headlines. But he wasn't the only killer around. Murder was afoot. The fear of death was everywhere. But police had their work cut out to track the culprits down. In this series, we'll be investigating some of the city's most notorious and intriguing crimes. The female defendant. Sexual intrigue. Vicious murder. As well as the latest technology fed the nation's insatiable desire for gruesome stories of London's dark side. In the early 20th century, all was not well on the continent. Tensions were mounting across Europe and revolutionary movements were forming. Many of the most ardent revolutionaries were sent into exile and London was one of the few places where they were welcome. Britain was a refuge for people escaping the pogroms in Tsarist Russia and Eastern Europe and so they fled to this country. And it was an open door policy which infuriated the Russians. Some of them were committing crime and it was a matter of great concern. Surprisingly, they could come in with weapons. Lenin would make London his home in 1908, along with many other Marxists. The huge losses of the Great War were soon to take their toll, and terrible outbreaks of violence and murder were already spreading throughout the capital. They introduced what they called the Aliens Act to register aliens because of concern about people coming into the country and the fear of crime that some of them would, would be committing. In 1909, the Tottenham outrage shocked the city when two Jewish anarchists from the Russian Empire carried out an armed robbery that killed two people, including a police officer, William Tyler. As a result, anti-Semitism and fear of immigration started to ferment. A year later, the Metropolitan Police would be involved in one of the most shocking chapters in its history, the siege of Sydney Street in the Whitechapel area. It all began when another gang of anarchists, this time from Latvia, committed the Houndstitch murders in East London. Some burglars were breaking into a jeweler's in Houndsditch. Um, city police officers attended and they were met by this firepower from very powerful weapons. Two police sergeants and one PC were murdered. Members of the Scots Guards from the Tower of London were sent to assist the police. The situation was so serious that the Home Secretary of the time, Winston Churchill, decided he had to head on over to Sydney Street immediately. Winston Churchill himself turned up and actually took charge of the operation. There was smoke coming from the windows of the house. By about two o'clock in the afternoon, the fire had taken hold. Eventually, the roof of the house collapsed and there was clearly nobody who was going to be alive. And they found the two dead bodies. At the same time as the Tottenham outrage and the siege of Sydney Street, the suffragette movement was becoming far more militant. And one vicious individual was taking advantage of the position in which many women found themselves. With no vote and limited economic and legal power, women faced gross inequality. Assumptions about their feeble intellect and incomparability with man abounded, even while the suffragette movement was fighting back. The latter half of the 19th century saw a lot of acts being passed in favor of women's rights, allowing women to keep their own property. 
allowing them to have their own children, separation from a husband. All of these things came into being. But women were still denied political rights. And the WSPU, the Women's Social and Political Union, led by Mrs Pankhurst, were the most aggressive of the suffragettes. They started off in a small way, smashing shop windows in Oxford Street. Attacks were carried out on politicians. One of the most famous caught Winston Churchill, who, who was opposed to women having the vote, and gave him a flogging with a dog whip. Uh, which attracted a certain amount of attention. <laughs> for most, the only hope of being provided for was in the societal structure that so constrained them, marriage. By today's standards, women had a rough deal. If they married, then the husband would normally take complete legal possession of their joint property. And so if a young lady had money of her own, then uh, it could be a very difficult position. So for young girls, the pressure to find a husband before it was too late was acute, as was the ensuing desperation for those older, still unmarried women that society threatened to leave behind. These women were numerous and easy prey for certain men. One such woman was Margaret Lofty, who in 1914, at the age of 38, had married a mysterious fellow who went by the name of John Lloyd and who seemed pretty well off. Margaret had had a hard life and marriage seemed to have passed her by. So you can imagine her excitement at this late bloom of love. The vulnerable, still heartbroken Margaret fell hard for the rich older man. She hid the relationship from her parents until they were wed. But poor Margaret only lived one night as a married woman. The next day, she was drowned in the bath in the lodgings she took with her new husband. That husband claimed to have found her dead in the bath, but all was not as it seemed. News of Margaret's death would eventually reach the desk of Inspector Arthur Neal of Scotland Yard, who was already dealing with the challenges presented by war with Germany. Where is it they're all being sent, sir? I mean, what harm's a German greengrocer going to do? Never tried sauerkraut, Sergeant. It couldn't have been an easy time to carry out a complicated police investigation. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand had sparked off the events of World War I, and the United Kingdom had declared war on the German Empire on August the 4th, 1914. It was a very nervous time. The war was giving us a lot of work. The Defense of the Realm Act had us interning aliens, tracking down deserters, enforcing curfews, you couldn't even buy binoculars anymore. That was banned. We were so dog tired of it all. The Metropolitan Police had made preparations in 1913 for the potential outbreak of war. They were tasked with monitoring the network of foreign agents working for Kaiser Wilhelm. Some officers who had retired were brought back into service. David Lloyd George and Winston Churchill had assigned uniformed women officers to supervise munition workers, a measure that would eventually give women greater consideration within the police service as a whole. There were more police at that time 
than I think at any, almost any other time. So policemen would later be called up as they were in the Second World War, drafted into the services. But in the initial years, we were only, the war has only just started. I don't think you've got a manpower problem or a lack of investigative officers. Soldiers back on leave or what leave they did have would cause disturbances. So there was a need for a police force. In a case of murder, the detectives would always investigate it. Among all the challenges thrown up by the outbreak of war, Inspector Arthur Neal would receive a troubling message from a concerned citizen. A potential serial killer could be on the loose, and his use of numerous false names was going to make him very difficult to track down. Fortunately, they had one of Scotland Yard's greatest ever detectives, along with a genius named Bernard Spilsbury, a real-life Sherlock Holmes, who would help bring the Metropolitan Police into the realm of forensic science. Margaret Lofty had died in the bathtub the day after marrying the mysterious John Lloyd. At first, it seemed her death had been a tragic accident. But Scotland Yard was about to receive a message from a concerned landlord that was to cast suspicion on Margaret's husband. Fortunately, Inspector Arthur Neal was on the case. He would eventually become one of the so-called Big Four, the four superintendents in charge of the Criminal Investigations Department at Scotland Yard. Very tragic, only 25, young, healthy woman. It came to light when Mr Burnham was worried about his daughter Alice, who had got married really um, against her, her parents' wishes. Um, but she had died on her honeymoon in her bath. One of the victims, the father, saw details of the death of yet another Mrs Smith and went to the authorities, and this was when the whole case began to unravel against him. Mr. Burnham read another account in the News of the World of another incident that had occurred in similar circumstances, and said, that's exactly what happened to my daughter. He went to the police, um, and Detective Inspector Neal took up inquiries. Inspector Neal knew that these two sudden deaths in bathtubs just a year apart couldn't be just a coincidence. He set out to solve the mystery. But it was 1915 and World War I had started. It wasn't going to be easy to catch a potential serial killer when the whole continent was about to collapse. The police needed to further investigate this earlier death in a bathtub. The first clues to this riddle lay in the coastal town of Southsea. Alice Burnham was a bright, pretty girl of 25. She was the daughter of a coal trader, had trained as a nurse, and by 1913 had found a position as carer to an elderly man in the beachside resort of Southsea. And that is when she met someone. An older man, certainly, but single, still quite handsome, and conveniently rich. This man of the world seemed besotted with her. And just a month after their first meeting, Alice wrote to her parents to say she was engaged. On the 4th of November, they were married against her parents' wishes at a register office in Southsea. And just six weeks later, she was dead, drowned in the bath. Her now widowed husband went by the name of George Joseph Smith. Who was George Joseph Smith? Well, he was a man who had a number of different names. 
He had um, a number of different marriages. He was a sort of petty crook and con man. I mean, at one point he's supposed to be dealing in antiques and general sort of wares. He had a criminal record when he was in his teens. He believed in dominating women and he could be quite brutal, quite prepared to beat them if they didn't do what, what, what they were told. The similarities between this case and the recent death of Margaret Lofty were stark. But could their husbands, John Lloyd and George Smith, be the same man? Or was it just a horrible coincidence? All the police had to work on was a general description of John Lloyd, husband of the late Margaret Lofty. There was no sign of Smith, no sign of Lloyd, and no clue if they were even the same man. Age unknown, birthplace unknown, height 5'10", eyes brown, walks with knees slightly bent together. Sir, this could describe half the country. Time for some real police work, then. Inspector Arthur Neal was working with Sergeant Harold Reed, who was making inquiries about the brides in the bath case. Together, they would visit the location where Margaret Lofty had died, and Reed spoke with the police constable who had been first on the scene. She was on the floor, naked. I told him to cover her up, the husband. It wasn't right. What did he look like? A bit over 5'9", brown hair, a little grey, full moustache. He was pumping her arms back and forth when I got there, trying to revive her, I suppose. I took over before the doctor arrived. I'm sure you did precisely as you were trained. Bath water was still warm. Lloyd had taken his wife to see the doctor the day before she died. Margaret had been suffering from a bad headache, apparently. Though the doctor said Lloyd did all the talking. The officers at Kentish Town Police Station made inquiries across the country as they tried to find John Lloyd and George Smith to see if they were indeed one and the same person, and to find out exactly what had happened to Alice Burnham and Margaret Lofty. Lungs and stomach filled with soapy water, as you would expect, but heart normal, brain normal. Any news from Bristol? They say without knowing which parish, sir, there's nothing they can do. Up to their eyes in work, apparently. Well, aren't we all? Yes? Speaking. Uh-huh. Yes. Interesting. Of course, do. You have the number. Thank you. A week before she died, Margaret took out life insurance, £700. Now her husband's solicitor is trying to claim it. Margaret had lied to get the policy. She'd claimed she was of independent means. And she said she'd no intention of marrying anyone either. Lloyd was behind it all, of course. He would first of all go to the doctor and saying his wife was having fits or seizures. Once this had been placed with the doctor, then he would take out the increased life insurance and then the wife would be drowned. George Joseph Smith went to the solicitors to pick up the um, details from his um, latest new wife's will, which was going to result in him receiving money. He found that in the solicitor's office was Detective Inspector Neal, who had some very serious questions to ask him. George Joseph Smith. 
Born 11th of January, 1872, Old Ford, Bethnal Green. No regular employment or fixed address. Sounds all right, Bounder. We'll need to find out all we can about his finances. You think there could be more, sir? So cool, so creamy, so lush, so rich. Wait till you taste the it was a system. Seduction, marriage, and then life insurance. And these sham visits to the doctor. I was convinced Smith had perfected it through practice. Their inquiries found out that a month before Alice took out life insurance, Smith had bought an annuity from the same company. The cost of that annuity was £1,300. It's worth more than a hundred times that today. That was a huge sum for a man with no obvious means. The pressing question for the police was what or who had been the source of that money. The answer to that question would help unravel the mystery of the brides in the bath. Little did the police know just how bizarre and terrifying a life George Joseph Smith was leading. The investigation would demand all the efforts of one of the greatest forensic scientists of the era and lead to an incredible trial that would capture the attention of a public looking for anything to distract them from the worries of World War I. Thanks to a lot of detective work, the Metropolitan Police had worked out that the husband of the recently deceased Margaret Lofty and Alice Burnham was a man born George Joseph Smith. He had used many aliases and entered into numerous bigamous marriages before disappearing with the women's money. But he was finally in custody. But Inspector Arthur Neal believed there may be other victims as yet undiscovered. And he was right. In 1910, Bessie Mundy was alone. Her dreams of marriage and family unfulfilled. Now 33, those hopes looked forlorn. But the following summer, she met a man. A Londoner calling himself Henry Williams. He entranced her with tales of the capital and of his travels across the globe as a painting restorer. A whirlwind romance led to marriage. Her father, a bank manager, had left her 2,500 pounds in his will. And this handsome amount was invested in a trust administered by her uncle. All the time Bessie was alive, the money was tied up in the trust. But should she die, the money would pass to the inheritor of her estate. George chose to marry a succession of women in order to benefit from the financial property that came with them and automatically their money on their death became his. The ladies um, all stress his charm his magnetic eyes. He said what an easy prey a woman was. He must have had some kind of hypnotic way of dealing with women, probably only exceeded by his greed in getting their money afterwards. For a man of commanding intensity to persuade a simple girl like Bessie to make him her sole beneficiary was easy enough. All he had to do now was get her to take a bath. Well, in truth, I could have passed the case on to a junior. Would have been fine, I'm sure. The whole thing could have been a remarkable and tragic coincidence. But well, Inspector Arthur Neal knew that two strikingly similar deaths involving the same man were unlikely to be a coincidence. His department contacted the Home Office's pre-eminent pathologist to help with the investigation. The pathologist wanted all the baths in which the women had died sent to London for further tests.
from the public, sir. Possible solutions. Apologies. Cabby ignored my instruction. Took an incorrect route. Are you just going to stand there or should we get started? That was Dr. Spilsbury, a brilliant man. Perhaps a little too aware of it even then. With Bernard Spilsbury's assistance, the police uncovered more and more about George Joseph Smith's life. They soon found out about his earliest victim, Bessie Monday, but were always aware that it was going to be a challenge to prove he was a murderer. The bodies of George Smith's three dead wives were exhumed, but little more could be learned from their decomposing remains, even by the esteemed doctor who examined them. This was Dr. Bernard Spilsbury. The science of forensics was fast developing, offering new and exciting ways of catching and convicting criminals. This was a time proud of its technological marvels. And in Spilsbury, the nation had found a real-life version of Sherlock Holmes. Bernard Spilsby made his name with, with the Crippen case and quickly established a tremendous reputation. He became the prominent pathologist who would deal with high-profile murder cases. He was very much like Sherlock Holmes. One thing he always insisted on was a good sense of smell. And there's a couple of famous photographs where the remains are out in the open and Spilsby's bending over with his nose in these rotting flesh. And the detectives at the side are turning away and it's quite clear one or two of them are going to throw up <laughs> what they're seeing and smelling. Spilsbury had been crucial in securing a conviction in the international sensation that was the trial of Dr. Crippen. Even more recently than that, though, Spilsbury had been called in for the case of Frederick Seddon. Seddon, just like George Joseph Smith, was accused of taking advantage of a woman, stealing her money, and then murdering her soon afterwards. Spilsbury gave evidence at the trial that led to Seddon's conviction for the murder of Eliza Barrow by poisoning her with arsenic obtained from flypaper but it was the Brides in the Bath case that would ensure Spilsbury's legacy. His reputation was so great at one point, even if he was wrong, jurors were prepared to believe him rather than another pathologist who in some instances were, 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 were clearly right. He had this legendary reputation. As Bernard Spilsbury became more and more prominent and well-known, pathology took a more and more prominence at these murder trials. It was more and more scientific, and it actually developed, if you like, the whole area of what we would now think of as being forensic science. Inspector Neil and Sergeant Reed carried out an experiment devised by Dr. Bernard Spilsbury. The Kentish Town Police and Dr. Spilsbury would work tirelessly trying to work out just how George Joseph Smith caused three of his wives to die in a bathtub without obvious injury or even clear signs of drowning. However, Spilsbury would have a flash of inspiration. They do like a good murder. And Mr Marchant from Highgate writes, it is quite possible to suffocate a person recumbent in a bath by pouring into it a sufficiency of carbonic acid gas. I worry how he came by such knowledge. Does Mr. Smith strike you as a scientific man, Doctor? Doctor! In 1841, the Caledonia sank off the coast of Cornwall. When the captain's body washed up on the beach the next day, something rather curious was noted. The shock 
of going into the water had rendered him unconscious so quickly. He still had a bag gripped in each hand when they found him. Inhibition, it's called. There was no sign of struggle. Mrs. Monday had a bar of soap in her hand when the doctor came. So cool, so creamy, so lush, so rich. Wait till you taste the air. So sweet, so dreamy, as it kisses your lips. Wait till you taste the air. Take time to savor the moment. Close your eyes, and you're in ice cream paradise. Wait till you taste it. 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 Wait till you taste the air. Your mom wants to do dinner on Saturday, and your sisters want you to text them back. Wait, when did you start talking to my family on purpose? Oh, I play Monopoly Go with them. That's great. Glad you're finally getting along. It's actually great quality time. And no sign of struggle. It was a theory. That was all. Not something that we could get a conviction from. So we worked hard, right down to the rock bottom facts. And by the end, we had 253 exhibits. Marriage certificates, death certificates, letters, photos, you name it. Every scrap of evidence I could gather. This man was not going free. The trial was one of the most complex in British legal history. 112 witnesses from 40 different towns. The public were transfixed. It's a welcome distraction from the war in France. English justice continuing unabashed. The sprinkling of sex and scandal, together with the strangely alluring figure of Smith himself, helped draw big crowds to the Old Bailey. Smith would be defended by one of the most famous barristers of the time, Edward Marshall Hall. And Dr. Spilsbury's theories would be put to the ultimate test when he took the stand hoping to secure a conviction for murder. The police had George Joseph Smith in custody. He was clearly guilty of bigamy, but they were determined to convict him of murder. Dr. Bernard Spilsbury had developed a theory as to how Smith had dispatched three of his wives, which he wanted to bring before the court. In accordance with English law, Smith was only tried for the murder of the first victim, Bessie Mundy. But in a legal first, the prosecution was able to use the deaths of Alice Burnham and Margaret Lofty as evidence of the work of a serial offender. The star witness took his turn on the stand on the sixth day of the trial, Monday, the 28th of June, 1915. Dr. Spilsbury, supposing a person taking a bath fainted, would the breathing respiration go on? To a certain extent. Can you give us any opinion at all as to what would be the result if the face was submerged whilst in a faint? Would the, the, the water would come into the mouth? Yes, and it would pass down into the windpipe. And what effect would that have? It would have a very powerful, smarting effect and would probably recover the person from the faint. Now, if that person had in fact been conscious and then was suddenly submerged, would there be a shock to the system? Yes, if it were unexpected. It might, even if it were expected. And if a shock were received due to a sudden submersion, would consciousness be kept or would that be lost? That would be lost at once. You mean immediately after submersion? Yes. Or almost immediately? Actually, 
immediately. Thank you, Doctor. In the trial, they explained that it is possible to drown in a bath if um, somebody's feet are pulled up from behind. I suppose we developed the theory that um, the baths that they were shown were too short and if the body had gone rigid then the body would not have gone below, below the water. A woman police officer acted as a demonstration of this at the trial. Spills, we nearly drowned her because what he did, he lifted her legs very suddenly and pushed the head down. And she lost all consciousness almost straight away. And uh, she had to be given artificial respiration. That was a very graphic demonstration which actually showed the method that George Joseph Smith had employed. Smith was defended by one of the greats of the day, the theatrical barrister Edward Marshall Hall, but even Marshall Hall found this case difficult. His early attempts to stop evidence relating to the deaths of Alice Burnham and Margaret Lofty being heard were unsuccessful. Edward Marshall Hall, the defence barrister, quite a flamboyant man, had uh, very good at persuading juries that there was um, an element of, of, of doubt and so on, um, and a very good sort of legal mind as well, and, and one of these sort of prominent lawyers of his age. Marshall Hall was, was known as the great defender. His party piece in the trials was to use the scales of justice. He would stand there and one arm would go up and one would go down, and this was how he would argue his case. So if you had Marshall Hall defending you, then um, that was a great reassurance, and he would do his best for you in the highest tradition of, um, of barristers. George Joseph Smith himself never came to the stand. Marshall Hall produced a note which showed that his client did not want to give evidence. But the great defender was hoping he could pick holes in Spilsbury's argument. Dr. Spilsbury, epilepsy is a very difficult subject. It has varied symptoms? Yes, it has. And of course, they can be extremely varied in degree. Yes. May I take it that many people have suffered from a very modified form of epilepsy, a very modified form of attack, without being epileptics? Yes. Have you known of women washing their hair in the bath? Yes. If you're in the bath and using soap, you cannot get the soap out of your hair very well by simply rinsing it with that same soapy water, can you? No. The very natural thing for a lady to do then would be to lean forward, put her head under the tap, and let the fresh, clear water run on her head. That would be one method. Assuming a woman had had a fairly hot bath and she was not in a very healthy condition, that is the evidence we've got, and she were rinsing her hair in this way and had a sudden fainting fit, would she not fall? The theory put forward by Marshall Hall was dismissed by Spilsbury, and although technically possible, it did nothing to convince the jury of George Joseph Smith's innocence. Overall, it was Bernard Spilsbury's brilliant mind and the dogged determination of Arthur Neal which would prove decisive. Marshall Hall's theatrical brilliance and flights of fancy failed to save this client. The jury retired on the 30th of June, 1915 and took just 20 minutes to decide George Smith's fate. George Joseph Smith was executed at Maidstone Prison on the 13th of August, 1915.
in a top-secret mission called Operation Mincemeat, which succeeded in deceiving Nazi forces and saving numerous Allied lives. In the interwar years, though, Spilsbury had testified in many other sensational trials. Bernard Spilsbury had this very eminent role in giving evidence in so many murder cases. Between the Crippen case in 1947, when he died, he did something like 21,000 post-mortems. The defence would say, well, if Spilsbury is appearing for the other side, we don't really stand a chance. Um, in modern terms, he would probably be criticised for giving his own personal opinion perhaps a little bit too strongly. And there are some cases where the evidence could have been interpreted either way. But he was a man of his time. He helped to convict poisoners such as Herbert Armstrong and Jean-Pierre Vaquier. But his method of working would be brought into question. He undoubtedly helped to convict and establish the truth of many, many high-profile cases. He lived until 1947. Uh, two of his sons had died and he was suffering from overwork. Eventually he went to his laboratory and cleared up all his paperwork and then quietly committed suicide. A very sad end to a, a very fine career. It may have been a very tragic end for Bernard Spilsbury, but he left behind a tremendous legacy in the field of forensic science and criminal investigation. And his monumental efforts had brought down one of the nation's most cold-hearted murderers, George Joseph Smith. Later in the century, he'd probably be classified as a psychopath a man who acted without qualm or scruple, but who nevertheless exercised great personal charm. But there was no such word for a man like Smith in 1915. He viciously exploited the inequitous position of women in society for his own ends. The suffragette movement did help remedy some of the many problems that women faced in this era and the outbreak of war led to all prisoners who were locked up for suffragette activities being released in amnesty. The First World War was altering society, ushering women into the workplace and later into the political world as well. But although their legal status did improve, it would be a long time before the role of women in society changed sufficiently for them to no longer be such easy victims for the likes of George Joseph Smith, the Brides in the Bath killer. The old morality and rigidity of pre-war days was not swept away by the carnage of the trenches, but would continue to affect the fate of women for decades to come. 